one step at a time. We're vegetable dependent animals, primates eating green, we two percent. So I always say if you don't like vegetables, then you better live close to a hospital. Right. Not gonna help you, but you know, it's the the point is it's a joke, but it's the point is you can't be normal. You can't expect normalcy with the percent of vegetables being so low in your diet. Welcome back to the Longevity Deprocess channel. We will learn from Dr. Joel Foreman about the science of anti-aging. He is a leading figure in nutritional medicine, best-selling author, and a trusted voice in the fight against the global obesity epidemic. Dr. Foreman has dedicated his career to helping people achieve optimal health through science-based nutrition, and his insights have transformed countless lives. Today, Dr. Foreman will take us through some of the most pressing issues in health and wellness. We'll explore the obesity epidemic, the limitations of BMI as a measure of health, and how you can optimize athletic performance through proper nutrition. Dr. Foreman will also share the only proven anti-aging program, revealing how certain dietary practices can help you age gracefully and healthily. We'll dive into the importance of including seeds in your diet tiny powerhouses of nutrition that play a crucial role in maintaining good health. And to cut through the confusion of the supplement industry, Dr. Foreman will outline the only supplements you might actually need to support a well-rounded, nutrient-rich diet. Join us as we explore these vital topics with Dr. Joel Foreman and gain practical advice that can help you take control of your health, enhance your performance, and live a longer, healthier life. Whether you're battling weight issues, looking to improve your athletic edge, or interested in anti-aging strategies. This video is packed with valuable insights and actionable tips from one of the foremost experts in the field. Oh, a quick favor. We'd greatly appreciate it if you can subscribe and like. This helps the YouTube algorithm recognize the value of our content and share it more widely. One step at a time. Oh, well, it's because foods that are processed foods and most of the high concentrated caloric foods rush into the bloodstream very rapidly. They're very different from foods that were available 20,000 years ago mm -hmm. and they become addicting and people dry, it increases their desire to eat more extra calories and they become, and recreating with food becomes their primary, one of their primary purposes in life. So I'm saying right now is that because they're not eating natural things like fruits and vegetables and mushrooms and onions and berries, because they're eating predominantly processed foods and animal products, which are more calorically dense and rush into the bloodstream with a lot of concentrated calories at one time. And the high concentration of calories in the blood has stimulatory effects on the um, apostats in the central nervous system and the dopamine receptors that make you dopamine insensitive and feeling empty unless you overly continue to overly stimulate them. So then people really don't feel comfortable unless they overconsume calories and they've disconnected their, the body's instinctual drive for calories. Instead, now they're driven to eat because of addictive relationships with food, but it's not really food because those foods are not really food. What I'm saying right now is like a bagel, a pizza, a burger, a croissant. Those are not really food because they act on the body more like a drug because white flour converts into the bloodstream as sugar almost instantaneously. It's like you just ate a sugar cube. And the high spike of glucose in the blood, which then results in a sur huge surge of insulin, which is the primary fat storage hormone, and then the high level of insulin increases your hunger as well. And the high surge of glucose in the blood stimulates the same opiate centers in the brain that are overly stimulated by narcotics and, and cocaine. And because these processed foods and commercial baked goods have no significant micronutrient load, they're not a source of vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and phytochemicals, they're just empty calories. And in order to convert glucose into energy, you need cofactors like vitamins and minerals, and then it produces free radicals. So to convert it into energy is difficult without those cofactors present, and the body has to strip itself of nutrition, nutrient reserves in order to do so. So it's an inefficient converter into energy. It's more readily stored as fat, and so you're still feeling fatigued 
and unsatisfied, even though you're overconsuming calories. So I'm just starting to answer the question. It's a very complicated question as to why we have an obesity epidemic and everybody in America is overweight, whereas 10,000 years ago, there was no, no overweight people on the earth and there's no overweight hyenas and you know squirrels and chipmunks and deer. They're all the same weight mm -hmm. and they all have almost the same lifespan. Mm -hmm. And primitive humans all have the same weight and the same lifespan other than accidents and things. But now we're suffering from these diseases, as you were saying, these diseases of nutritional, ex predominantly of, of caloric excess and the wrong type of calories. We're eating a diet not well adapted to the design of the human species, and therefore we get disease. So I'm making this radical claim, which you're supporting, is that heart disease doesn't have to happen strokes does not have to happen and even most of the cancers that afflict americans would not don't have to occur and would not have occurred in human history the first cancers that were recorded in the scientific literature were in the 14th century among chimney sweeps who first were noticing they're getting scrotal cancers and testicular cancers from being exposed to smoke but there were no large amounts of people with colon cancer and breast cancer and prostate cancer. That didn't happen to for um, hundreds of years later when people were able to get more calories, build up body fat, he have more animal fats and processed foods. It's this combination between the excess amount of animal products, which includes animal protein and saturated fat and processed foods, which now, which of course includes high glycemic carbohydrates and refined oils. And that combination of those, um, that dietary portfolio is very inflammatory promoting and disease promoting and creates an untold amount of human tragedy. And people are so confused about nutrition. Mm -hmm. And while they're so confused and while the whole American population is overweight, Americans are eating 2% of their diet from vegetables, 2%. Dr. Foreman explains why he has chosen a body mass index of 23 as the demarcation line between normal and overweight as opposed to 25 as federal regulators have. One step at a time. <laughs> and I'm saying all long-lived societies and long-lived individuals, centenarians, have BMIs below 23, not below 25. So the optimal BMI for lifespan purposes for a male is below 22 and for a female is below 21. So if we permissively allow 23 to be the demarcation line between normal weight and overweight, then that classifies 89% of Americans as being overweight, not 75%. Mm -hmm. It's 89%. The, 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 um, you know, the National Institute of Health and the, and the conventional health authorities are too permissive. You're still overweight if you have, you know, and I'm saying that because we measure insulin levels, HSCRP, myeloperoxidase, oxidized LDL, we measure telomere length, right? We measure methylation defects. We can measure things that show your biological age. And we see that um, as, a male's BMI, as a male's body fat goes above 15%, these numbers go out of whack. As a female's body fat goes above 25%, the numbers go become abnormal. And I'm saying there's, with inflammation, immune suppression, um, deactivation of gene silencing, we're all talking about gene silencing means the body can recognize and silence abnormal genes. It has the ability to recognize and repair de gene defects. The body has the ability, this, the body has this miraculous self-healing capacity that is deactivated by excess calories and by excess body fat. So I'm suggesting that there's no such thing as a healthy, overweight person, that all people that are overweight are unhealthy, even if they're not diabetic yet. Because even if they're not diabetic yet, their insulin is, is too high because fat on the body makes you insulin resistant. Mm -hmm. And the insulin resistance, then we, the beta cells in the pancreas have to produce more insulin to digest, to keep the sugars in the normal range. So even if the sugars are in the normal range, you still have high production of insulin, which puts you in my definition of pre, in a, in my definition of diabetes in a pre-diabetic state, because that is, that's itself is accelerating atherosclerosis even before the glucose starts to rise. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying here that if you take the 11% of people in America with a BMI below 23, and we look at them. Most of them are smokers, alcoholics, medical conditions like autoimmune conditions or depression. So most of them are normal weights because they're unhealthy, unhealthy. It's only 4% of Americans that have a favorable BMI because they exercise regularly and eat relatively healthfully. 
because they've done it through healthy diet and exercise. 2.4%. Mm-hmm. The rest of them are either overweight, because I'm saying if you're normal and you're eating like other Americans eat, then you're supposed to become overweight or something's wrong with you. The doctor will now tell us why most athletes don't have to get to an unnaturally large size to perform well. One step at a time. You can be an optimal athlete and be as super strong and fit and fast mm-hmm. for tennis, for skiing, for boxing, for basketball, and not and you don't have to get to unnaturally um, large size. You don't have to eat, take steroids. You don't have to get unnaturally big. But you have to get unnaturally big to be a linebacker on a football team mm-hmm. or a big power lifter. And the amount of calories they have to eat, some take even steroids. Mm-hmm. But the amount of meat they have to eat, the amount of calories they have to consume, they even have to sometimes get extra body fat just so their body can get larger on top. So they have more weight at the line. Mm-hmm. And, and the NOSH study showed that linebackers on football team have the shortest lifespan of any occupation in North America. That eating a diet to try to get to unnaturally large size. Mm-hmm. You know, I was a professional athlete in my, myself. I was on the world team in figure skating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, but being lean, you know, obviously, you know, look at the top tennis players in the world. They've got low body fats, but they're not unnaturally. They don't have to get huge. They just have to be have muscles for protection. Mm-hmm. You know, the basketball players, mm-hmm. skiers, you know, um, soccer players, a perfect example. Be mm-hmm. the greatest soccer player in the world, but you're not going to be built like a linebacker on a football team. Yeah. As you get to a certain largeness, that degree of largeness becomes an impediment to longevity. We, you know, I'm I'm a hundred and I'm five, about five nine and a half. I used to be five ten, so let's say I'm five nine because I'm now almost seventy years old. My body fat's still low at eleven percent. I can still do sixty push-ups, you know, ten shins, mm-hmm. and I can still bench press one hundred forty pounds. I can bench press my body weight, you know. I'm still, I can curl 80 pounds, you know, I'm in a dumbbell. I'm still strong, but I'm not going to be, but if I, in order to, for me to get to be, instead of 150 pounds, in order for me to get to 160, 170 pounds, I got to go off my diet. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have to eat more animal products and eat more calories to get that large and get, and build, if I want to get my strength up, instead of put benching 150 pounds, I want to be bench 170 pounds or 180 pounds. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to be able to do that at this body weight. And with this diet, mm-hmm. I'm going to have to eat more unhealthy to get that big. Mm-hmm. I'm still plenty strong for skiing and tennis and soccer and surfing and basketball, but I'm not going to be strong to be a, a power lifter mm-hmm. or a, you know, or a football player, but you can be a quarterback like yeah. Tom Brady. He's lean. You know, mm-hmm. you can be a quarterback or a line or a, or a, um, or a tight end or a receiver. You just can't be a linebacker, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so yes, a lot of these people working out in the gym, they want to get too large and they're instructed by their trainers diets that enable excess largeness that's going to shorten their lifespan because when you eat that much animal protein that accelerates muscle growth to that heightened degree you elevate IGF1 and insulin and mTOR which are factors that allow cancer cells to replicate wow dr foreman was on the world team for figure skating now that's a conversation starter Next, the doctor will reveal how achieving a slower metabolism aids longevity in stem cells and telomeres. One step at a time. Don't forget, less calories lowers our basal metabolic rate. Less calories do. Mm. And we have fewer calories. We're aging slower. We're burning the furnace cooler. And we're aging slower, which makes our telomeres um, don't, our telomeres don't, don't age as fast. And our stem cells are maintained better with less calories. Dr. Foreman will tells us the effects of extra calories on, on our metabolism here. One step at a time. Your body resists gaining and it resists losing. Mm-hmm. Your body has a set point. When you eat excess calories, it doesn't just put them on as fat. It speeds up your metabolism to try to burn some of those calories off. So, it, so you age faster when you eat excess calories. And so you gain 10 pounds. You weigh way over your caloric needs because your body turned a lot of those extra calories, not into fat. It turns it into a higher metabolism. And mm-hmm. when you cut back on calories to a degree, you don't just lose weight all the calories you cut out. Your body's going to resist losing because it wants to maintain its mess, muscle mass and it wants to maintain its set point. It doesn't lose that easily if it has very little fat. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you'll cut back on calories and instead of losing so much weight, you lose less weight, but your body will slow its metabolism down. And that's the anti-aging science. Here we will learn about how we can find our longevity weight. One step at a time. 
I could say that the only proven methodology proven to slow aging, reproducible in hundreds of studies with all types of species of animals, including primates, is moderate caloric restriction in the context of micronutrient excellence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we know that those five words, moderate caloric restriction with micronutrient excellence. And as we achieve micronutrient excellence, and we have a lot of salads and berries and onions and mushrooms and seeds and you know, we have all these good healthy foods, it naturally suppresses our apostat. So we don't desire as many calories, mm -hmm. and we get more instinctually connected to the right amount of calories that we need to maintain us at our longevity weight, our maximized longevity weight. Whereas in the American diet form, oil and sweets and meats and fats, they're, they just are so disconnected to their instinctual longevity weight. Mm -hmm. Dr. Foreman will respond to the idea that seeds and nuts are not important for longevity. One step at a time. You know, frankly, it's kind of strange that there could be any controversy with regard to this because there shouldn't be a controversy. Because there's literally probably a hundred studies on the subject that all show positive effects on longevity and reduce cardiovascular death. And, you know, a nutritarian diet. You know, the American diet gets its fat from animal fats and oils, like mm -hmm. olive oil and canola oil. A nutritarian diet gets its fat from nuts and seeds and avocado, from mm -hmm. whole foods. Mm -hmm. That's a big change, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that there's a plethora of studies that show that as seeds in their dietary portfolio, they reduce all-cause mortality, they live longer, and they reduce cardiovascular deaths by about 40%. That's been corroborated. That's been corroborated in numerous studies. I recently published a study about a year ago or so in the American, in the International Journal of Disease Prevention and Reversal. I was we asked the um, Dr. Um, Kim Williams, the former head of the American College of Cardiology, and who was the editor of the journal, asked me to write a to write a review article on nuts and seeds for cardiovascular prevention and reversal. And I wrote an article published um, entitled Nuts and Seeds for Cardiovascular Prevention and Reversal, and I put 50 references in. Anybody who's an unbiased observer or scientist studying this issue and reviewing all the data could not say, could not advise somebody to take nuts and seeds out of their diet. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, it's just a very small amount. You, you mentioned earlier about you were enthused by doctors who embracing nutrition and plant-based nutrition. I went, I was one of the founding members on the American College of Lifestyle Medicine where 30, 35 years ago, we would have five to 10 people in a room, but now their conferences may have 10,000 people and they may have members, may have 20,000 members. There's a lot of, and what I'm saying is uh, out of these tens of thousands of physicians specializing in nutrition, there can't be more than a handful that advocate removing nuts and seeds from a diet. It's mostly based on um, mistaken um, interpretation of the science that happened maybe 20 years ago. And these people who are giving more, I don't know, I don't want to be critical, but I don't think they update their viewpoints when more evidence becomes available and their prior viewpoints become disproven. Mm -hmm. Now the doctor will describe how, on a nutritarian diet, his clients are rather quickly able to find their optimal weight. Are the people that come to my retreat here in San Diego who are usually significantly overweight, 50 to 100 pounds overweight. I had a guy who's here now, three weeks, he lost 30 pounds in three weeks. Whoa. The person just left, he lost 100 pounds in three months, but they usually lose about 25 pounds the first month even eating a pretty good amount of calories, eating good, you know, good amount of satisfying food. But the point I'm making right now is that these people, because they're eating so healthily with so much bulk and so much fiber, they're satisfied with the right amount of calories. Mm -hmm. And then they, they gravitate pretty quickly to their optimal weight, you know, and they're, and they're not restricting nuts and seeds. Well, I'm, I'm feeding them a half an ounce of nuts and seeds with every meal like a tablespoon of heaping tablespoon of ground flax and chia seeds on their oatmeal or amaranth or, or their grain and their berries in the morning. They're getting about a half an ounce of nuts and seeds in the dressing 
on the salad for their lunch with a vegetable bean soup. It might be an orange cashew dressing, sesame dressing, or a or a Russian fig dressing with almonds and fig vinegar and roasted garlic and tomato sauce. You know, there's about a half an ounce of nuts and seeds in the dressing. Maybe the dip at night has a hummus dip or a or a salsa dip or something, or or the dessert, maybe a frozen banana ice cream with some nuts and seeds to make it creamy. There's about a half an ounce of nuts and seeds in the diet, but that's because these people are overweight, and I'm counting how much nuts and seeds I'm giving them. But people who are athletic or slim or low body fat like you and me who are exercising more can eat more than that because our caloric needs are a little higher. So whatever we're eating, our caloric needs are modulated to our own metabolism, our own basal metabolic rate, our own need for calories, how much exercise we do. But so, yes, um, these foods are not unlimited, mm -hmm. but we, neither do we have to exclude them totally because that leads to a whole host of the different problems. You know, mm -hmm. increase mm -hmm. inflammation. For example, the heart relies on ALA, alpha linolenic acid, to stabilize its myocardia. And you have increased risk of atrial fibrillation on low-fat diets. An increase in the physician's health study had a six, showed a 60% increased risk of sudden cardiac death in men who did not eat nuts and seeds compared to men who ate at least an ounce of nuts and seeds a day. In the wow. Seventh-day Adventist Health Study 2, and when we're talking here about the ALA in walnuts and hemp seeds and flax seeds stabilizing the heart against atrial fibrillation and, and irregular heartbeat that can cause sudden cardiac death. Mm -hmm. And it's the same that we found the same information in the Seventh Day Adventist Health Study too. That I'm, even among that study is so important because it's studying people who are Seventh Day Adventists who generally aren't smoking and drinking alcohol. They exercise regularly. They're advocates of eating healthy and more plant based. So among even healthier eaters that were more plant-based, vegans, near-vegans, flexitarians, those, we still saw, saw a 40% change, a 40% advantage, lower, 40% lower rates of cardiovascular death in those eating more than an ounce and a half a day compared to eating those eating less than half an ounce a day in the Seventh-day okay. Adventist Health Study 2, published in 2018. So there's, so we have to give more credence to these large study large studies following thousands of people for decades compared to one or two studies following 50 to 100 people for six years or something. Mm -hmm. We're not going to see really, we have to look at hard endpoints. We have to look at large numbers of people. And all these studies, scores of them corroborate each other and show the same basic information. So I have to say no controversy. There's no controversy. Mm -hmm. The studies, they can't come up, the person having that viewpoint can't come up with studies. They're mm -hmm. not there. What about the need for supplements? The doctor responds to that question. The main ones are B12 and DHA, mm -hmm. and the third most of concern is zinc. D vitamin D and iodine are maybe of concern in some populations, but people know they can get, you don't have to supplement that. You can get enough sunshine for vitamin D, depending on where you live. Vitamin D is important if you live in a northern climate, but it depends on how much skin exposure you get, you know, sun exposure you get. Mm -hmm. Iodine is also depending on whether you eat seaweed or not, or exposed to some, so it's really, so, but, but the hard, the top three are DHA, EPA, the, the commonly called fish oil, which you can get from a vegan source, mm -hmm. these, and, and um, vitamin B12 and zinc, which we have decreased zinc absorption with aging. And even though plant foods contain zinc, the phytates bind zinc to make it less absorbable than those getting zinc from animal foods, animal based foods. Mm -hmm. And as we age, the ability to absorb zinc diminishes, and zinc supplementation in the scientific literature is linked to enhanced lifespans, less dementia, less immunosenescence, leading to lower rates of pneumonia and prostate and breast cancer. A lot of data that zinc plays an important role and can play an important role, but there's not necessarily a lot of studies um, on supplementing zinc in vegan populations. But we have a lot of data to suggest that vegan populations have lower zinc exposure, lower zinc body levels, and would and those would most likely benefit strongly from zinc supplementation. The other two, the other two are more definitive mm -hmm. than zinc. B12 is definite is more definitive. That lack of B12 can lead to neurologic deficits that are particularly dangerous. And the same thing with true with DHA and EPA, low levels of the omega-3 index which measures the EPA and DHA levels on the surfaces of your cell membranes, your red blood cell membranes, lower levels over time, 
are linked to shrinkage of the brain and cognitive impairment with aging. And every study looking at that issue showed the same thing. Any long-term study that followed people for decades, identifying those with low omega-3 index, show those groups with more brain shrinkage and more cognitive impairment. Mm-hmm. Now, I originally started um, advocating that this and, and supplying it was the was when my history of being in this plant-based movement for more than 50 years now. I'm almost 70 years old, but I've been doing this since I'm 15 years old. Wow. You know what I mean? So, um, but the point I'm making right now is that my mentors and the people I looked up to in the natural hygiene movement who were eating super healthy vegan diets and taking B12, when I, you know, when I admired these people and learned from them, and then I became a doctor and they became elderly and all my mentors and people I admired all developed either dementia or Parkinson's, not all of them, but most of them developed it. Like Dr. Shelton died of Parkinson's and Dr. Sidwa died of Parkinson's and these people who, and Dr. Vetrano, Dr. Shelton's assistant had dementia in her later years. And Dr. All these people who are her, what I'm, and, and then my patients as caring for the vegan community back then, you know, seeing people from the American Vegan Society, and American Natural Hygiene Society, so many of them developed neurologic deficits. They didn't get cancer and heart disease. And when I measured them as a doctor now, I'm the doctor and now they're my patient and they're the elderly person who used to be the doctors. Or you, These are people who are now in the making up this community of health enthusiasts mm-hmm. with so much um, neurologic deficits because they lived so long, but I checked their blood, many of them, scores of them checking blood levels showing radically low levels of omega-3 index, explaining the deficits we saw, and subsequent um, studies to that have absolutely indicated the risks. You know, it seems that people get into their dietary philosophies in a re- such a religious nature that they're, they don't, it's like, a, it's like being a Trump supporter. You know, they don't let the facts influence their prior decisions and they become fanatically and can't weigh evidence. And I think that like here too, there's an overwhelming amount of evidence that if the omega-3 index is too low, you're placing yourself at health risks. Mm-hmm. So I think that there's, just like with B12, I think the data is overwhelming and conclusive. And some people may differ. They talk about theory. They say, oh, vegans don't have more depression and don't have more dementia than non-vegans, which is irrelevant because non-vegans have dementia because they're eating so unhealthfully, because they're not eating antioxidants and phytochemicals, not all for DHA deficiency. With vegans eating so healthfully, it's the DHA causing the dementia that occurs. There shouldn't be any dementia in vegan populations, not because it's just because they have less dementia or the same amount as standard American diet use. Irrelevant. They all give, they give a whole host of irrelevant arguments mm-hmm. like, you know, oh, the level in your blood isn't the level in your brain or the level, or your body gets enough. We can see we don't want, but you're right. We don't need to supplement if we're going to live a normal lifespan compared to the average American, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. most people won't get dementia mm-hmm. and won't get problems with DHA being marginally low if we're going to be dead by the age of 80 years old. But if you're going to eat so well, he lived to be 90 or 100 years old. And I said the average lifespan of humans should be between 97 and 107 years old. Mm-hmm. And if we're going to push the envelope of human longevity, then we have to live in a manner to prevent aging of the brain and the natural decline in brain size and and brain cognition as we age by using EPA DHA at a middle in in our younger ages and maintain it through our through our later years. Mm-hmm. So I think it's very very irresponsible and to allow your followers to take those risks with their mental health. Next, watch the Dr. Joel Foreman Club playlist for more information on the nutritarian diet. Thanks for watching Longevity Deprocessed. Hit like, share, and subscribe to stay updated on evidence-based longevity tips. Share your thoughts in the comments. Your journey matters. Remember, small daily habits create big changes. Until next time, keep deprocessing for a healthier, longer future. Let's make this journey together.